fusion of entertainment and enlightenment. This is the Glenn Beck Program. Do you know why other nations are rising up and standing in the streets? Why you have so many professors in uh, Canada standing up and defending free speech? It's far more than what we have here in America. Do you know why? I was told by one of them, because you're under this delusion that you think your government will just always stand guard and you won't lose your right to free speech. We don't have that right in Canada or in England. They don't have it. So they know once somebody starts to infringe on it, they better stand up and it's pretty late for them. But I fear it's growing even later for us in this new democratic socialist utopia we're headed toward. We begin there in one minute. This is the Glenn Beck Program. Uh, this is really, this is the, there's a university in Australia that found that women prefer the body odor of men who eat fruit and vegetables than those who eat a lot of refined carbs. <laughs> I mean, that's reason enough right there to make sure you get your vegetables. No, no, no. That is reason enough there to not send your kids with your dollars to a stupid university. Uh, so, all right. So here's the thing. Uh, eat your your vegetables and your fruit. Your mom used to say that to you. You got to have your fruit and vegetables. Got to have your fruit and vegetables. Yeah, 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 whatever. I ate it. And I don't know of a guy who's like, hmm, you know what I really could go for is a salad. Shut up. I don't want to hear from you. Um, real USDA organic fruits and vegetables complete with all the antioxidants, the stuff that boosts your immunity, antioxidant power, prebiotic, probiotic. This is real food. This isn't a supplement. And all you do is you take a spoonful of it and you stir it into whatever you're drinking and you, you take it and you're done. And you've got everything that your body needs, including that, that sweet, sweet aroma that apparently women love. <laughs> I'm telling you, I just take, uh, I just, I would like a cologne that smelled like Cinnabon. And I think, I think a lot of women would love, would love me. It would be very attractive to me. Have you noticed he smells like think, Cinnabons all the time? I, I think a lot of people who look like you would love you. And I don't know if that's exactly what you're trying to attract. Okay. All right. So let's say we make it into a perfume. No, because then people like me would be attracted. I don't know. I'm still working on the Cinnabon <laughs> perfume. In the meantime, go to BrickHouseGlen.com and order Field of Greens. 15% off of Field of Greens right now at BrickHouseGlen.com. Promo code Glen. You know, in the free market system, Stu, I could come up with my Cinnabon perfume, and I'd let the market, I'd let the people decide, not like you in your socialist democracy. I have Justin Haskins on who's going who's gonna to agree with me. The free market is the right way to s figure this Cinnabon thing out, <laughs> isn't it, Justin? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's the right way to go. I, I certainly so. don't want the government coming up with a Cinnabon uh, perfume. Well, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. <laughs> They wouldn't. Good point. Um, they would never do that. They would never do that. They don't know what the people want. Right. Right. All right. So you you're the author of Socialism uh, is Evil. And I've been I've been reading it. And it's a it's a quick read. It's like, what is it? 80 pages. Yeah, like 75 yeah. pages or something. Um, so it's a quick read. And it is made for uh, you have anybody in your life that is a socialist. You have anybody going to school that is a socialist. This is a quick starter on why socialism is evil. Uh, and I wanted to get you on to make, the, uh, to make the case, but I want to talk to you about a couple of things. First of all, tell me the difference between socialism and communism and democratic socialism. Is there a difference? Yeah, in my opinion, there's absolutely no difference at all. Um, and, and actually, if you read a lot of socialist material produced by modern socialist parties today, the Socialist Party of Great Britain, various socialist groups in the United States, they will flat out say there's basically no difference. 
between communism and socialism, and that democratic socialism, what's being called democratic socialism or European-style socialism, this is basically just incrementalism. It's moving us toward this grand socialist utopia that Karl Marx has all mapped out for us in the future. They don't want to do it right now at this very moment because they realize that people aren't ready for it. They would never go for it. Um, But they want to move us in that direction. And at the end of the day, the goal is the same. We want to go to a world where everybody has exactly what they need and nobody has what they want. We have, Justin, we, I have said this um, recently, and every time I say it, people are like, oh, no, no, no. I believe we are at the end of the American progressive era. The progressives took, took it now as far as they can take it. Now it's time to take off the mask because progressive was really European socialism. It is, let's take this and we're not going to cause a, a, a riot or, well, riots we will cause, but uh, no revolution. We don't want blood in the streets. We're just going to move it incrementally and people will eventually uh, want it and we'll call it progressivism. Now we're at the point to where you got to name it and it, what you're naming is not America it is a, a fundamental flipping of the Constitution and of the Bill of Rights, and it's now socialism. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly right. We're moving toward a society at a rapid pace where you don't have any individual rights. You don't have any individual property rights. You don't really have freedom of speech. We're seeing that slowly being eroded away, uh, that all of these things are going to go away in favor of the collective, because the collective is what really matters. And anyone who's interested in this should read the Soviet Constitution. The Soviet Constitution is amazing. It's schizophrenic. In some parts, it says you have freedom of, uh, you have a right to freely practice your religion or free speech. And then in other parts, it says, well, only if it doesn't bother the collective. If it gets in the way of what the collective wants, well, then actually you don't really have those rights. And that's, that's what modern democratic socialism in the United States is moving us toward. This society where you as an individual don't matter. What matters is what the collective wants. And if your desires, your beliefs, your religious beliefs, your moral beliefs, if that gets in the way of of what's good for the collective and who gets to decide that, well, the collective, I guess, uh, then too bad for you. Uh, You need to just shut up and sit down. Democratic socialism, they're saying, no, we we want democracy. We want people to have the vote. But then they deny when something like Venezuela happens. They'll say, oh, well, that's not that's not a democratic socialist. Well, yes, he was Maduro was elected until the wheels came off. And then he said, you know, because it's we're in a dangerous situation now. (laughs) I can't let that election happen the way it's supposed to happen. And then he rigged the election and eventually stops all elections. That is the logical conclusion, because you could you could hire Jesus, but but Jesus, because he's not really Jesus, is going to die. You could have Gandhi do it. But once he dies, the next guy comes in and people vote him in. If he's corrupt, it's autocratic. It's there's there's no restraint on him. Yeah, that that's true. And even if you could have and this is something I get into in the book, I mean, even if you could have this this mythical world where everyone is is collectively owning and managing property and everybody is happy with collectively owning and managing property temporarily. Even if you could somehow do this without completely eroding people's liberty, without throwing people into concentration camps and doing all the things that socialists and communist parties have done for the past 100 years, you need to find a way to do that. You still have important moral controversies that occur in, in, in life. Uh, for instance, in a single-payer healthcare system, do you pay for abortion or not? Do you pay for contraception or not? Are you going to force nuns to pay for abortion and contraception, or aren't you? If you have a socialized healthcare system, you can't escape those questions. The collective decides what society is going to do. And if you happen to be in the minority, if you're a moral minority, well, too bad. You either have to go along or you have to go to prison. But that, those are your only two options. You bring up the moral case, and this is part of what you're talking about. Um, the, to me, the moral case um, for the free market uh, is, is dirt strong. And the moral case against socialism 
perhaps is even stronger because of things, as you point out, you're going to have to, you know, alcohol, you say in the book, alcohol, 40 percent of America. I can't believe it's that high, but 40 percent of America says, you know, drinking is immoral. Well, are are they going to be are they going to have to own the uh, the alcohol production? And how do you force somebody to do it? You mentioned it with birth control, but there's more to the moral case. And I think we're seeing it in Venezuela. It, you're killing people. Yeah, you ha- you, and that's the thing. Socialism inevitably leads to a complete to complete chaos because anytime you try to force people to receive the same amount of wealth for doing the same amount of work as people who are working not nearly as hard as you are, it, it's a race to the bottom across an entire society. People stop working hard because there's no incentive to work hard. And normally, you incentivize people by giving them a profit, by, by paying them more money. But you can't do that in a socialist society. Right. So how do you convince people to work harder? Well, you put a gun to the back of their head, and you say, work harder. And if you say, well, we don't like this, then you go to prison. You go to the internment camp, and you learn your lesson, and then you get to come back in society and be a slave for the rest of your life. That's how socialism inevitably works. It fails every single time because it's in fundamental violation of human nature. Right. And you get into the, you get into this um, socialism's fatal flaw where you you talk about um, its flaw is that it denies human nature. But I, I it, yeah, it, expand on that. Expand on that. Yeah, it, humans, like, as I was just saying, humans are motivated by their own individual um, achievements, by their own goals by what, what, what would benefit them and their families. That, that's just a fact. That's what motivates humans. Socialism flips that on its head and says, stop caring about yourself. Stop caring about your family. Stop caring about your kids. None of that matters. What matters is the collective. Sacrifice yourself for the good of the collective. And when you try to do that, I mean, just think about this in your personal life. Think about this in your, in your own workplace. I mean, everybody who's worked a job knows that there are people at the company who aren't working quite as hard as you're working and how that makes people feel around the office. I mean, it never works out well because at a fundamental human level, we understand that it's not fair to reward people equally for disproportionate amounts of work. Even kids understand this. This is, this, this is basic human nature. And yet, Karl Marx and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders and all of these people would like to pretend that these things don't exist. This is this is this is this whole system is completely delusional. And when you read Communist Manifesto, that's what you walk away with. You say, well, how can you know? A lot of people talk about, well, why do kids on college campuses uh, read Communist Manifesto and become socialist? And, and you know, obviously, there are a lot of professors out there indoctrinating kids with communism and socialist ideas. No question about that. But I think that a simpler solution is that they're just all high and drunk and stoned out of their mind, and that those are the only people who would ever find this to be an appealing system. It doesn't make sense. You know what? If you've had four joints, then yeah, communist manifesto makes a lot of sense. But if you're not stoned, it's completely illogical. Like I said, even little kids understand this. Well, they they say that communism uh, or socialism, socialism is about sharing. And yes, kids don't, you know, you say they understand uh, that socialism is, is wrong or the Communist Manifesto doesn't make sense. But that's why we have to teach children about sharing because they don't automatically know about sharing. And that's what that's about. Let me give you a chance to respond to that here in a second. One minute and we'll be back uh, with his response. You know, I heard on the Glenn Beck program today, he had some guy on who wrote a book called Socialism is Evil. Socialism is about sharing, Justin Haskins. (laughs) Yes. Well, in order to share, you have to have a choice, right? That's the fundamental aspect of sharing. You have to choose to give your wealth away or to give whatever your property away. You have to choose to share. And there is no choice 
in a socialist society. Excuse me. No Excuse me, Justin. But even our parents didn't give us a choice. They they put us in time out until we learned. It's just that we are like children and the government knows better and knows and we all know the principle of sharing is best. And so some people are going to have to be put into time out. What's the problem? What's the difference between what your parent did? <laughs> right. Yeah, well, the, the difference, I think, fundamentally, is that the government has absolutely no right over you and you as an individual, whereas your parents, of course, have that right. And the government doesn't know what the heck it's doing. It can't manage its way out of a paper bag. It can't run the post office. It can't. It, that's just delivering mail. It can't run Amtrak. That's just running trains on time without having literally hundreds of millions or billions of dollars uh, in deficits every single year. The government is totally incapable of managing anything. So the idea that we want to give the collective, which is really the government's representing the collective, all this power over our lives because they would know how to use it best and they know what the right moral choices are and the wrong moral choices is insane. The government is running a $22 trillion national debt right now. And yet we want the, the Democrats are asking us to give them control of the healthcare industry to give them control over the the energy sector. I mean, what makes us think that they if they can't run trains in the post office and the DMV, why the heck do we think that they can run our health care system? So it, tell me the difference between uh, socialism here in America and all we're talking about, Justin, is just the social system, the socialist country of Denmark or Sweden. It's great there. This is maybe the most important myth that we need to debunk in this entire conversation, because I've talked to so many young people who identify as socialists or identify on the left, and they always point to Denmark, Norway, and Sweden as being these examples of great socialist countries. Uh, they're not socialist countries in reality. They're mixed market capitalistic systems. Uh, the, the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Institute have done analyses of World Freedom Index um, and, and the Heritage Foundation Freedom Index, for instance, shows that Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland all scored higher than the United States in the categories of property rights, fiscal health, business freedom, government integrity. Does this sound like a, like a socialist utopia to you? I mean, they have balanced budgets in many of these countries. They're not running $800 billion deficits. Norway has a trillion dollars just sitting in its sovereign wealth fund, and they only have 5 million people in their country. So these, these are not – these countries have a couple of policies that the left likes, but they're not really socialist utopia. And by the way, they're not better off than we are. Uh, when, after taxes, the average, average worker in, in these Scandinavian countries, they earn less than the average American worker. They pay a lot more for their various goods and services, and their housing costs are much, much higher, in some places twice as high as what it costs. Uh, the average American in, in various parts of the country. So uh, they're not better off than us, and they're not socialists anyway. So this is, this is a giant myth that Bernie Sanders and Alexander Ocasio-Cortez are, are telling everyone around the world, convincing them, uh, despite the fact that leaders in those countries are saying, no, we're actually not socialists. Uh, I guess we're supposed to believe Bernie Sanders and not the actual people living in Sweden and Denmark and Norway. Justin, I appreciate uh, all that you write for, uh, you know, for us at The Blaze, and, uh, and uh, I was really impressed with uh, your ability to communicate with an audience at CPAC. That's a rare talent, and you have it. Um, and uh, love your book. Thank you so much for being on. It's uh, so Socialism is Evil by Justin Haskins. Uh, it, you can find it online. Uh, grab it. It's 70 pages. It's a paperback, easy to just fold in your pocket and give to somebody. Socialism is evil. You can follow him, by the way, on Twitter at Justin T. Haskins.